any legitimate ways that Christian people can look at God that is more inclusive, that is less dominated by dogma, and is less open to the sorts of abuses and intolerances that a great deal of evangelical Christianity is subject to. That is the only point that I am trying to make, and the only point that to me seems important to make. And that's why we need to be working together to look at things and to look at the issues that matter rather than essentially trivial ones about the existence of God. Each speaker will have uh, up to five minutes for a summation. Dr. Gray. In my final round, I would like to try to draw together some of the threads of the debate to see if we can come to any conclusions. Have we seen tonight any good reason to think that belief in God is false? I don't think so. In the last speech, again, we simply heard the assertion that belief in God leads to intolerance and absolutism. But I don't think that that's, even if it were true, relevant to the truth of whether or not God exists. You cannot judge the truth of a view by looking at its social consequences. But in any case, this is certainly not true for anyone who follows the views of Jesus of Nazareth. No one can accuse Jesus of Nazareth of intolerance and bigotry. This is a man who taught his followers to turn the other cheek, to pray for those who persecute them and despitefully use them, who taught us to love not merely our neighbors but our enemies. And if the Christian church has failed very often and frequently to follow the ethics of Jesus, that is our failing rather than his, and therefore does nothing to suggest that what he taught uh, about God is in any way false or untrue. So I don't think we've heard any good reason to think that atheism is true tonight. What about the arguments for the existence of God? Here, Dr. Cook emphasizes that my notion of God is not the only game in town, that there are theologians who don't agree with me on the worth of natural theology, that is, arguments for God's existence. Well, of course that's true. I I in no way suggested that my views are... Uh, universally held. But you can't use that sort of argument to refute arguments that have specific premises in them leading to a conclusion. The only way you can refute an argument like that is either by showing that there is an invalid inference, that, that it's illogical, and none of them commit logical fallacies, I can assure you. The only other way then is to suggest that one of the premises is false. And apart from that, you cannot avoid the conclusion. So you have to either show me the invalidity of my argument or show, tell me which premise is false. And until you do that, I think we have good grounds for believing in God's existence. And moreover, I suggested that in contrast to earlier scholars like Schweitzer, who wrote around 1910, Bonhoeffer, uh, even Kuhn, that uh, there are quite a good number of philosophers today who think that the project of natural theology is very viable and who have defended arguments such as the ones that I've been giving. Well, what about these arguments? The argument from the origin of the universe has yet to be refuted in tonight's debate. I have made a study of cosmology. I did my doctoral work in uh, Birmingham on this subject and have continued to pursue it And I quoted uh, scholars such as Valenkin, Borg, Guth, and others in support of these, uh, th these uh, premises. So I think it's a good argument. Same with the fine-tuning argument. Uh, if you're going to contend that God doesn't exist, then you need to inform yourself about these arguments so as to be able to handle them. The moral argument, we agree, I think, that in the absence of God, there really are no objective moral values. The question is, do you believe there are such things as objective moral values? Do you really think that torturing a child is wrong, that loving a child is not morally indifferent? And if you do that, I think you're committed to God's existence, given the truth of the first premise that we both agree on. The resurrection of Jesus, uh, again, I, I answered his arguments there. And finally, the immediate experience of God. He says, I'm not denying your immediate experience, but then in the next breath he turns around and says, it's a projection 
on the universe. But how do you know it's a projection unless you have some good argument for atheism? In the absence of an argument for atheism, why think the experience is delusory? I myself wasn't raised in a Christian home or even a church-going family. But when I became a teenager and began to ask the big questions in life, who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? Someone shared with me the love of God and the gospel of Christ. And as I read the New Testament, I was absolutely captivated by the person of Jesus of Nazareth. His teachings had a, a ring of wisdom about them, a ring of truth that I'd never encountered before. And there was an authenticity about his life that I couldn't deny. And after about six months, I yielded my life to Christ in faith and became a Christian. And it turned my life completely upside down. So if you ask me why I believe in God, sure, I could point to the arguments. But I would also point to the immediate reality of God in my own life. And until I'm given some good reason to think that I'm deluded, I think I'm perfectly within my rational rights in believing in the God of biblical theism. If I may indulge in a metaphor, Dr. Craig has constructed a resplendent golden palace in the tide lagoon of our ignorance. I am not a cosmologist, and it is ill-advised, to say the least, to build resplendent palaces on shifting sands. 400 years ago, it was quite uncontroversial to believe that the Earth was the centre of the universe. Those few who did contest the claim were forced to recant or burnt at the stake. But each attempt by Christian conservatives to try to anchor a God idea in something supposedly objective inevitably slips away on a new tide of learning. Dr. Craig's God idea is in such a position already and acts as a barrier to wiser, more humble notions of God that the great theologians of the 20th century explored. Against this, the atheist is content to live in a state of imperfect knowledge and does not presume to deserve a full explanation, and certainly not one that panders to one's anthropocentric conceit as fully as Dr. Craig's God idea does. Atheism, by contrast, is the condition of simply being without an idea of God that isn't just somebody's assertion. On the basis of cosmic humility, we can proceed to learn about how the universe actually works and to find our purpose and our meaning under its vast canopy. This is what I call humanism. The real conversation we should be having rather than sterile tussles about whether something essentially unknowable exists or not, is how best to alleviate the suffering in the world here and now, and how best we can exercise a responsible stewardship of the planet for future generations. Because whether we like it or not, that is our responsibility and ours alone. Chinese language, there's no word for God. Now, 
and, and, and the 